Let us begin with a little bit of food for thought, and we're going to extract a snippet from a particular research article, which we'll cover the title in a second. But let us begin with a quote. In contrast, there was no significant difference in the risk of many other outcomes, including death and any long COVID feature. We are going to be looking at the chart real fast. Here we go. Now what we're looking at right here is time and days. As you can see right there, 0 to 150. This should hopefully render in 4K so you can read that. Outcome probability. Long COVID right there. And to keep in mind, this is an individual 60 years or older. Now we are, since we're here, let's look at it. Mortality. Again, the pink, which I did not cover here, is vaccinated. The blue is unvaccinated. And there we are. So that's what I mean by no significant difference in those which are vaccinated in reference to those 60 years or older in regard to mortality as the outcome or a long COVID. Now, that particular research comes from the article, which we'll cover a little bit later on, but I just want to start with something kind of counterintuitive. Six month sequelae, which means infection, or prior infection, a post-vaccination SARS-CoV-2 infection, a retrospective cohort study of 10,024 breakthrough infections, which is kind of weird because check this out. All right, so here's this article that comes out in the research in reference to basically not the best outcome in those 60 years or older. And then the CDC releases theirs, which says COVID vaccines five times more effective at preventing COVID-related hospitalization than prior infection alone. In fact, they even said that found adults over 65 or older, the mRNA vaccines were nearly 20 times more effective at preventing hospitalizations than prior infection alone. Now keep in mind, they didn't uh, give me any data reference points to look at, so I don't want to bemoan or bias the data per se, uh, but I have nothing to compare it to to figure out why this outcome for, released by the CDC is so different than this outcome presented here by these particular researchers as follows, which is pretty detailed. And uh, again, a reference to vaccination. But, oh, which keeps in mind too, let us check out how Florida is doing compared to the other states in reference to our data analytics. And there we are, the new deaths per 100,000 smoothed. And we have Texas here, New York, California. And we'll bring it up to date. Da, 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 da. And so now we are our current time, and I believe it's almost Halloween, and please forgive my uh, my weak brevity in reference to uh, the celebration of All Hallows' Eve, but here we are. Florida, mortality rate per 100,000, 0.17. California, 0.23. New York, 0.93. And Texas has its own challenges, and we all know what those challenges are. But Florida, land of Neanderthals, 0.17, minimal lockdowns, minimum um, vaccination mandates, after you count the federal stuff, whatever it is. And yet it is outperforming the other states, which are a little more strict in reference to pandemic mitigation factors. So the argument is not, you know, whether pandemic mitigation factors such as masking and so on and so forth works in a controlled environment, but does it work in real world settings? That's the question. And if Florida is outperforming two other states which are renowned for its lockdown measures, then how truly effective are those lockdowns, vaccine mandates, and so on and so forth? So right now, Florida for the win. All right, again, it is now almost midnight, so we'll just say it's October 31st for the sake of simplicity. And welcome all data analysts, data scientists, bioinformatics, uh, epidemiologists, you know, and all data analytic audience as usual. And gratitude, I'm glad you're here. And what we'll be covering tonight is as follows. And let us begin. This is Syzygium, the it's all tongue twisters. Syzygium aromaticum. Oh gosh, I can't even say it. Syzygium aromaticum. Again, SARS-CoV-2. For those not familiar with Syzygium aromaticum, guess what this is, ready? And we'll cover this research in a second, but just to give you an unbiased look from Google, doo -doo -doo. 
clove. Syzygium or aromaticum? Say that three times fast. And that's what it is. So what we're looking at basically is we're going to be looking at what is, where did my research go? Da, 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 da. There it is. It basically is clove. And that's actually quite interesting. We'll go a little bit of detail into the research itself because it gives a great explanation of how they extracted uh, the particular components from the clove. Heparin, incredible research. Uh, as far as uh, the timing of the heparin, SB through injection, and how incredibly effective it is. And yeah, if you're reading ahead of time and you see this, yeah, but it's got to be within 7 to 14 days. But what an incredible uh, ability to basically mitigate the likelihood of a negative outcome as death. And that's pretty incredible. And we'll look at that research in a second too. And then another treatment, uh, benfotha, be, benfoxythiamine. You recognize the word thiamine? We're just going to look at that real briefly, but it actually is kind of cool. And then two, the path from pollutants of... Now, people might think, well, the path from pollutants in food to a heightened allergic response. All right. Now, the reason that I'm, I'm interjecting this in reference to the coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2 stuff is because we know that the predominance of vitamin D in reference to its correlations uh, in having positive outcomes in those which may be exposed, exposed, exposed to SARS-CoV-2. And the reason being is cadmium degrades vitamin D, but we'll cover that in a second. So that can lead to confounding when looking at doing vitamin D analysis in reference to SARS-CoV-2 outcomes. If you look at an area, for example, that's uh, contaminated with large amounts of cadmium, you know, their vitamin D intake can be adequate, but it's being diminished real rapidly. All right, after that, we're going to be looking at da, 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 this great article, COVID-19 vaccination mandates in vaccine uptake. Very, very counterintuitive into how effective vaccine mandates are. Now, this is more societal, but still just the same. It's a national health thing, and it actually has an inverse reaction, as many people probably already know. All right, two, and then do, 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 do. autoimmune conditions following mRNA and inactivated coronavirus vaccination, the scripture cohort uh, among 1.1 million vaccinated people in Hong Kong. All right, what this is going to do, and this is not to be bone the vaccine. Uh, or basically add publisher bias in reference to the outcome of the research. But there are some interesting signals popping up, and we'll get to that in a second. And I actually changed the data dashboard, which I do, uh, to bring up some of those to light as far as those safety signals. After that, uh, a great little article from the uh, Associated Self-Reported High-Risk Allergy History with Allergy Symptoms After COVID-19 Vaccination. Now, the researchers believe the risk is worth it, all right? Because again, based upon the element of how serious you view uh, the the potential of a negative outcome reference to SARS-CoV-2 or, corona or COVID-19, uh, compared to anaphylactic shock. So basically, it's not for me to decide for anybody else, but at least I wanna give you an idea of what they believe is acceptable and not to be belittle what they believe. And what they believe, I truly do believe they believe. But however, though, you have a right to know and make a decision based upon the information presented here. All right, to proceed as next, statins, uh, not likely help from reducing COVID-19 mortality or severity. Not only, this from John Hopkins, not only is it not likely to help, it is really, really, really may be detrimental in reference to taking a statin and being infected by COVID-19 at the same time. But again, correlation is not causative. We'll look in the research in a second. Then, this is just more, uh, it's not really trivia, but to give you an idea how hard this pandemic or the lockdowns are having on people's ability to even think clearly. And so we'll cover that in a second. And then basically another great one, HES research discover how people's values affect attitudes to COVID-19 restrictions. And it's a really good little 
excerpt here on basically um, how you can promote anti-democratic policies across the globe. So it kind of something to basically to get your ear, to basically to rile you up, but still just the same. It is it is pretty interesting how you could actually come very undemocratic, anti-democratic, very rapidly, regardless of the motivation. All right, then here we go. The persistence of neutralizing antibodies up to 11 months of SARS-CoV-2 infection, southern region of New Zealand. Again, uh, it's just going to reiterate this is a really interesting story because it is the fact that these individuals were not vaccinated, there were no re-exposures, and yet they checked to see if they had antibodies that were still persistent after 11 months, and obviously we'll get through that in a second. Of course, obviously, it's a yes. Then, six months uh, sequelae, post-vaccination, SARS-CoV-2 infection. We already went through the part of that, and I showed you the picture there. We'll cover that more in detail in a second. And then also, too, boosting of cross-reactive antibodies to endemic coronavirus by SARS-CoV-2 infection, but not vaccination. This is intriguing. The researchers do not fully know what this means. Nobody knows what moves aside what this means. But there is a difference between being vaccinated and having a natural infection, which is quite strong, uh, strongly delineated or separate between the two. So they're not even, I mean, they don't know what it means. But at least what I would like to do is highlight the research here and hopefully someone gets some details into what it does mean with future research. All right, then of course we presented here, COVID-19 vaccines five times more effective at preventing COVID-related hospitalizations of prior infection alone. Pretty much is flying directly on the opposite angle of all the research that you and I have covered. Now keep in mind, we do exhibit a little bit of selection bias because no one is presenting the information on the research that you and I have been reviewing over the past year. And you know, that if was listened to in the beginning, a reference to waning infection, uh, the basic vaccination should be based upon the receptor binding domain as opposed to S proteins or spike proteins, so on and so forth, in order to improve vaccinations, mutations, leaky vaccines, so on and so forth. But just the same, uh, I bring it to your attention because I would really like to see the data that they utilized in order to come with their conclusion. I want like to know what they're thinking or how they think uh, in reference to that. And then compare it to the data which we've already presented here. And of course, for those truth seekers out there, fact checkers, or whoever is working diligently to keep the internet clean from misinformation, the information that we are gonna resent or the present that we're gonna resent, we you will resent all the information. The information that you and I will basically review today is gonna be presented from, <laughs> it sounds like a commercial, the VAERS, and real important to reference the VARES. Oh, by the way, the VARES data set now is that a zip file is 146. We'll cover the size differential at the second. But the VARES data, let's get to the uh, disclaimer first. Uh, very important monitoring vaccine safety. VARES reports alone cannot be used to determine if vaccines caused or contributed to an adverse event or illness. The reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. This is also going to go to the for the Yerdur Vigilance uh, database, which we're also looking at today from Europe. They're updated as well today in reference to reports. We'll be looking at our world and data. Again, the, the best data site out there right now, one of the best. If I'm missing somebody, please forgive me. Uh, the GIS aid, which we utilize in order to determine our mutants, mutant strains out there, which is pretty much is Delta. All right, and then now is the Delta Plus, but however though, it's pretty much Delta. All right, then healthdata.gov, and still they got some great information in there regardless. So now let us begin with the research as follows. And then of course, we're gonna cover our data. And uh, just because we looked at the various real fast, let's get a good comparison there. All right, now for those not familiar, we're looking at the zip file size from Veras. We're just going to get this out of the way real fast. So if we go back to Veras, just for just for you to see, the zip file size for 2021 is 146.34. What this is representing is a condensed file of all the vaccine adverse event reports reported to the CDC from January 1st of 2021 is 146 megabytes approximately. All right, now when we compare that, 
with all of the years prior from 1990 to 2020, 33 decades worth of data, it ends up being 122.53 megabytes, the file size, all right? Now, we compare that with all the data collected just from January 1st of this year to, it is now October 31st, happy Halloween, uh, to today, it's 146.34 megabytes. So I ask this question every single week. Does the CDC, if, someone, if you took 30 years of the data and you threw it on a researcher's desk and said, all right, find me some safety, safety signals from these vaccines, which is of concern. And now if you, someone did that three, 30 years of the data and just threw it on your desk, you'd say, well, that person, obviously, that's a lot of work. All right. Now imagine today. I don't. I would like to know. Does the CDC have the personnel to actually look through all these safety signals? Because we have more than this. Just between January 1st to October 31st, or back basically probably October 20th around there, uh, after accumulated data, that's 146.34 megabytes. That is a difference in size of 23.8 more. A 23.8 more. 23.81 megabytes greater than the files the prior three decades, which yields you uh, basically, here it is, 19.43% greater amount of data for CDC researchers to go through in, refer in reference to vaccine adverse event reports than the prior 30 years, which if you want to look at a comparison now each year, da da da, here we go. This, oh, it got me in the way. There it is, 2021. That's all the data accumulated just from January 1st, 2021, to about October 22nd, around there, uh, 2021. And this was all of 2020 right there, 2019, da-da-da-da-da. So that's what I meant. Do you have enough personnel at the CDC to cover all of these adverse event reports and be able to protect the public potentially from a, uh, a negative safety signal? So you see what I mean? That's what I'm always a little bit concerned and weary about because no one's answered that question to date. All right, but let's begin with the research as follows. Da, da, da. Here we go. Do, do, do. That's amazing. All right, we went through the disclaimer and there we are. Novel pectin from crude polysaccharide of Syzygium, Syzygium, or aromaticum, aromaticum. All right, here it is. Now to keep in mind, this is in vitro, but it's promising. And of course, what was Syzygium aromaticum? Syzygium, Syzygium aromaticum. It was, again, clove. And so it's actually kind of interesting. And it's, it's kind of cool too. Now, how effective was it? Let us look. Here we show, obviously I'm quoting, that, nine, that 922 crude polysaccharide, it's potential polysaccharide from the clove they're trying to extract. And they found out this crude polysaccharide from Syzygium aromaticum may, may near completely block SARS-CoV-2 replication. The inhibition rate was 99.9%. And it goes into detail on how it actually did its job. And that, that is something very, obviously very available, very inexpensive. And now I am not making any recommendations whatsoever, so please keep in mind, but I wanna go through exactly how they went through the extraction process because they go through a quite detailed aspect of this. Dried flower buds from Syzygium, aromatic, Syzygium aromaticum were purchased from, all right, well, I'm not asking anybody to buy any. And then it goes through basically how easy it was uh, from the extracted water and alcohol precipitation and brief the dried flowers, you know, I'm not going to read through the whole thing because I'm going to have the link uh, on the YouTube site regardless. But it goes through the great detail in reference to what they did. And it's really quite interesting because I like the fact that they didn't just say, hey, it's Syzygium or Grammaticum or Clove, whatever it is, achieve this incredible aspect. You can see the weights they utilized. Uh, the research is quite uh, enlightening. They do a great job elucidating the information in reference to basically what they're doing. But keep in mind, vitro is not vivo. And there's, of course, its inhibition rates and so on and so forth. So 
but it needs to be validated in future research. Everyone compares everything to remdesivir. And so basically, so clove, or these extracts from clove can beat that, that's pretty amazing. And it goes into discussion, great detail for the researchers out there, uh, in distilled water, so on and so forth. But again, in vitro, it's not in vivo, it needs to be carried out into uh, uh, animal studies and eventually to human studies, but it's clove, it's freaking clove. If clove can actually work like that in a living body, wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. But next amazing thing, here we go. I'm just, I'm just like really shocked that a lot of these research articles are not making any of the media out there, including the people which are like, you know, there's, there's too many different tribes out there. But again, great information out there. Heparin dose capable of preventing COVID-19 deaths is four times higher than dose recommend, recommended by the World Health Organization. So they're saying the World Health Organization is really, really recommending a small amount. But regardless, this is one of the main findings of a clinical trial involving 465 patients at 28 hospitals in six countries, including Brazil. The likelihood of dying was 78% lower for the group in a given therapeutic dose of the anticoagulant. The anticoagulant heparin reduces the likelihood of death from COVID-19 by 78% when administered in therapeutic doses to patients with signs of respiratory failure on admission to the hospital, according to a study report in October 14th, British Medical Journal. All right, some of the highlights. The results also showed that in order for heparin to be beneficial, this is important, it must be administered between 7 and 14 days after the onset of symptoms. Benefits were observed during this stage of the disease were only when heparin was injected. The good news is the drug is cheap and available via the SUS, Brazil's National Health Service. So that's that kind of like it's so Brazil's obviously got had a you know was ravaged. But however, though, now this is like inexpensive, it's available. Now they got the window of time where it works the most effectively. And you have a possibility, another mitiga uh, mitigating factor in reference and reducing the likelihood of a negative outcome and as is in mortality. It goes, heparin helps avert this process via two mechanisms. It dissolves the mic microthrombi that prevent oxygen from flowing from the alveoli <laughs> to small blood vessels in the lungs. And it contributes to, to regeneration, to the regeneration of the vascular endothelium. <laughs> I was like mispronouncing it, endothelium. And so it's like, that's amazing. That is an amazing, amazing, amazing treatment. We've been reviewing heparin for quite some time. So sometimes you do not want to administer it at all. And then sometimes like now they did that window of seven to 14 days. Again, the link will be there on YouTube. And this information could save a lot of lives here, you know, in other countries, not just you know, not just Brazil. So I'd love to see it incorporated. But here we go. Next, after that, potential new treatment for COVID-19 identified. Again, you and I have been doing this for a year now, once a week, and we've discovered plenty of potential new treatments. Now they got to work to actually get them. Um, if, you know, imagine if they actually took the money in trying to incentivize people taking vaccines, per se, not being an anti-vaccine, pro-vaccine, and they actually took that money and invested it into these, these great research breakthroughs to carry them through to human trials. I mean, yeah, that's the whole thing, especially the ailments can be endemic unless you only want to get vaccinated every three to four months. Because when applying the drug ben benfoxithiamine, an inhibitor of this pathway, SARS-CoV-2 replication was suppressed and infected cells did not produce coronaviruses. That's pretty amazing. So it, again, everyone takes the remdesivir. Uh, everyone takes a shot at that. Uh, works differently. And so it's actually what got my attention first was seeing thiamine. But you see what I mean. Research is there. It's published. It'll be linked as well. Next, after that, the path from pollutants in food to heighten allergic responses. This is pretty uh, detrimental along large uh, segments of society. So in areas where you tend to have contamination of cadmium, uh, or for example, people ingesting cadmium through cigarette smoking and otherwise, you have to keep this in mind. Um, see, for example, most people ingest the natural element of cadmium, a heavy metal used for batteries and making pigments by eating plant and animal foods that absorb the pollutant or drinking contaminated water. All right. 
So, vitamin D plays a huge role in pandemic mitigation. So you're not seeing COVID on here, but still, let's read through. Researchers traced this link in mice to gut bacteria, gut bacteria, that after exposure to ingested cadmium, overproduced an enzyme that degrades vitamin D, effectively creating conditions that mimic vitamin D deficiency. In terms of clinical effects, the mice sensitized to a specific allergen that consumed cadmium produced high levels of antibodies against the allergen, as well as immune cells that increase their respiratory symptoms. And here's the problem. Because cadmium does not degrade easily, it has a half-life in the body, you and I, of at least 15 years. So you see what I'm talking about. It's start drinking water contamination, allergic reactions, uh, changes the micropopulation in the gut. Uh, because we know dysbiosis and dysbiosis, well, that's the whole pandemic lockdown thing, which we're about to pay a price for that. I'm concerned because dysbiosis has been pretty heavy throughout our society uh, within the past few years. But you get the idea. Uh, intestines leaky, so on and so forth. So it'd be interesting if someone's concerned about vitamin D status, they can't seem to get the vitamin D levels up high enough. Maybe they should check their system for cadmium. Uh, I'll be right back in one second. Hang on. And back. So you can see how cadmium can play, especially when you're looking at a lot of, I would say, economically depressed areas or underprivileged areas, um, per se, underprivileged. Uh, but you know what I mean. Uh, that basically areas which tend to be more prone to contamination, uh, it, can, it can save a lot of lives. So again, uh, it just takes subtoxic amounts of cadmium. So you think about it, uh, we're going to read it right through here. And this is from mice, of course. But it's, it's worthy to check in areas, for example, that may have been ravaged by, for example, SARS-CoV-2 uh, for cadmium levels. You get the picture. All right, next. COVID-19 vaccine mandates and vaccine uptake. This is trivia. All right. So here we go. All these mandates making everyone hate everybody. And so now we're making vaccine mandates. So if you're a policy or decision maker in a political position and you really think, hey, well, what if I had your mandate? And then I can get everyone to do the vaccines because they have to listen to me. Well, au contraire. What they found out, part of the confounding that part of the confounding that may play a role is what may end up happening is that people that were just going to get the vaccine anyways just got it earlier after the mandate. But the people that were not going to get it we're not going to get it. You ready? You want to see how much they're not going to get it? So let's read this little excerpt here. This is just more for trivia. Second, if an increase in vaccination observed as seen in the data does not increase or occur because of intertemporal substitution. Well, this may be a little bit complicated. Uh, this just tells you basically we would have got vaccinated a little earlier. But here's, here's the, the outcome. Bottom line in Canada. We estimate 289,000 additional first doses for Canada as a whole. 0.9 percentage points of the eligible population, which is one to eight weeks after the policy announcements across policy announcements across the different provinces. So all of this pushing and shoving and all these mandates and edicts and whatever you know the, the feudal lords think they're basically pushing on the indentured indentured servants, uh, basically 0.9. Now you, I mean. So, and then what they're recommending here too, towards the end, if you of interest, is they're saying, you know, the carrot and the stick approach, obviously. They say the stick, nah. They said the carrot, better opportunity. In their case, they were looking at financial incentives, having a far more favorable outcome in reference to vaccination, as opposed to saying, hey, I'm telling you what to do. You know, it doesn't come off right, especially when you think about politicians are hired by the people to work for the people. And but somehow it got reversed. Now politicians believe the people work for them. And no, the, 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 the people may tolerate it, but 0.9 percent after slapping your foot down. Well, that's a good way to lose uh, uh, how would you describe it, your sense of uh, authority or um, whatever whatever you want to call it, they're no longer pertinent. Yeah, it's a great way, to, great way to not become pertinent any longer. I don't know if that's the case in Justin Trudeau's case, if he's pertinent any longer, but he got reelected. So 
I don't know, but here we go. Next, autoimmune conditions following mRNA and inactivated the two different vaccines. This is just for safety sake, not to scare anybody, but they brought up a really interesting adjunct in reference to basically certain things went lower and certain things went higher. Now, the problem with a lot of researchers here in the United States is we now are starting to use this word called background rates. Well, the myocarditis, you have the 5,000 cases of myocarditis, well, that's less than the background rate. Well, the problem with that is this. In order for that argument to be accurate, that means every case of myocarditis has to be reported as a vaccine adverse event. And that's obviously not the case. So if you're going by 2019 rates for myocarditis, for example, and you look at the vaccine, there was like 8,000 cases of myocarditis uh, in 2019. And then you say, well, then you look at the vaccine adverse event reports and there's like 7,000 uh, cases of myocarditis in the vaccine adverse event reports. And you go, well, that's less than the background rate. How do you know that? Because that means all myocarditis has to be reported as a vaccine adverse event report. What if it's not? What if there's additional vaccine adverse, uh, additional case myocarditis that have nothing to do with vaccines? Then you have to add that on top of the ver vaccine adverse event reports. So you see the confounding that gets involved. And so they're looking at that and they're doing this and this and so on and so forth. But let's scroll down to the information. This is what they're finding out. The incidence of reactive arthritis and narcolepsy related disorders were relatively high compared to the other acquired you know, immune disorders with a cumulative incidence ranging between 4.12 and 8.35 per 100,000 persons. Now, people go, well, that's like hardly anything. But no, that's a lot of the first dose recipients. And here's a little chart right there if you want to see the vaccines they used. What? And here is all the looking at there. And you see that the, I don't know what color that is, yellowish orange, narcolepsy and related disorders. Here we go again. You remember a long time ago, uh, a certain in, it, uh, vaccine got pulled in Europe. I'm not going to bring up any names uh, because of uh, narcolepsy in children. Uh, but still, here we are. And so then I guess what this, the, you're looking at um, transverse mellitus. I don't believe that. Is that the color purple there? Again, but however, though, you see right there, it's, is these are the reactions. This is the signals. Uh, basically, they're beginning to pull out. So that's what they're trying to do. Uh, and so they're trying to basically look at the accumulation in the background areas. But so the cumulative incidence of hospitalized autoimmune disease among vaccine recipients and non-vaccinated individuals. So they're trying to find that. And so what they're finding out, the incident rates of reactive arthritis and narcolepsy related disorders were relatively higher compared to other acquired immune uh, diseases with cumulative incidence range before pretending to own first dose for vaccine recipients. Um, similarly, the majority of autoimmune conditions followed the second dose, also had a 28-day cumulative incidence, less than 100,000 reactive arthritis and narcolepsy from a CIDP appeared to have a numerically higher incidence in the corresponds with the incidence of the first dose. And let's go down. Da -da 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 And we read through here. In the additional analysis that removed the requirement of 28 days follow-up, we observed more diseases with an IRR greater than one, although they did not reach significant levels. This might suggest that some autoimmune manifestations may take longer than 28 days to develop, and the risk window for vaccine safety monitoring needs to be a thoughtful adjustment. The non-significant results shown in this study reflect the natural rarity of acquired immune disorders. Similar to the observations from other COVID-19 vaccine safety studies, individuals who received the vaccines, all right, here we go. The healthy user effect. So this, we were very familiar. All, everyone that took statistics recognizes the healthy user effect. Who received vaccines are generally healthy. You know why? Because here, let me just read through it. They give a great explanation. Generally healthier with fewer comorbidities than the general population. In the HK, the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccination program prioritized healthcare workers, personal maintaining personnel, maintaining critical public services, and care home residents in the initial stage. So you see where the confounding takes place. You're not vaccinating people that may be immunocompromised, the elderly, and so forth. You're vaccinating individuals which are generally healthy. 
And therefore, in the beginning, when the people in the vex getting the vaccine are people which are actually working and moving around, they're relatively healthy compared to those that are not, you're going to have some confounding. Henceforth, the healthy user effect. Now, at that time, only care home residents, only 5% received the vaccine. And so you're going to get confounding. And that may be part of the reason why something like this from the chart we read from this study we're about to uh, look in a second had this effect, which didn't show up in the beginning because the health user effect. With great interest, we observed potential safety signal of narcolepsy. Here we go again. And related disorders following the first dose of the BNT162B2. Narcolepsy. It became an interest. The initial motivation for including narcolepsy in the list of interested acquired immune disorders was due to the widely reported increased risk of narcolepsy. Here we go. I'm going to let them read it. From the pand uh, pandemrix, which was the H1N1 influenza vaccine. Recipients in the European countries and Canada during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, which could contribute to vaccine hesitancy among COVID-19. They believe, now this, this is the interesting part, considering the potential delay in miscoded diagnosis of narcolepsy from inpatient settings. And so they had to basically look at it and it was classified as something else. We found that hypersomnia was predominantly coded, but no case was coded for narcolepsy. So here you are. They have no case code for narcolepsy, but they have to look at hypersomnia. Interesting, isn't that? There is a recent proof of concept study that uses wearable devices found an increase, here it goes, increased sleeping duration up to four days post BNT162B2 vaccination. The sleeping signal detected in the study encourages further investigation on the immunogenesis mechanism and association between mRNA vaccine and sleeping disorders. There is a recent proof of concept study using wearable devices found an increased sleeping duration up to four days. Let's see if I showed that here real fast because we go to Vera's report. I want to see if I updated that. Now we'll get to that in a second, but here, uh, and I'll show you at the bottom. I started adding hypersomnia, hypersomnia to, the, uh, to the safety signal report. All right, but you got that already. All right, next. So. After that, associated with self-reported high-risk allergy history with allergy symptoms after COVID-19 vaccination. All right, obviously we're in the JAMA here. Let's just read down here. Now I'm going to read you nothing more than just what they write because I, I don't want to add publisher bias. Actually, I do want to add publisher bias, but I really don't. I want to keep this clean. Here we go. You ready? Let's see. Can we make this a little larger here? Do, 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 do. There it is. Here we go. We found that a self-reported history of high-risk allergy was associated with a 2.5-fold higher risk of self-reported allergic reaction in the three days after vaccination and approximately four-fold higher risk of hives, angioedema, edema specifically. All the reporting of severe allergic reactions to an mRNA COVID vaccine was rare. Those with a history, that's everyone, those with a history, here it goes, of high-risk allergy were at nearly five-fold increase for these reactions. And such reactions were verified, verified by specialists. In most individuals who saw clinical care for the symptoms within the Mass General Brigham system. Uh, again, uh, anaphylactics, uh, allergic reactions. It's, it, uh, you know, I don't know. Like it, if it's a mandate and you have to and you have to work, and they see that the risk of COVID is greater than the risk of people having a severe allergic reactions, which are allergy sensitive. Um, yeah, that's that's all I can say. Just um, just um, I would say uh, be safe. All right, I'll catch you in a bit. Next is this catch you in a bit. <laughs> Please don't take it that way. I just mean make a wise decision and for an employer to force an individual that has a high risk of allergy into taking such a risk that that, that that's i don't i don't find that noble in any way shape or form all right here it goes next after this statins the statins not likely helpful in reducing covid19 mortality or severity from john hopkins medicine 
And I'm just curious, did any of you guys hear this in the news? Any of you, guys, gals, uh, other, you know, whomever? Uh, did you hear this in the news? Because if you were on a statin and you became seriously ill with um, COVID, and then you read this. Statins likely do not confer any impact, positive or negative. All right. However, the caveat on COVID-related mortality, and remember this is a big and, or I should say big may, may be associated with an significantly increased risk, nearly one chance in five of more serious illness. One chance in five of more serious illness. Again, research needs to be done. Uh, if it doesn't help and an individual is worried about COVID and they're on a statin, they may want to discuss this with their medical provider if, uh, you know, if this is a concern. And now, could it be the fact that people on statins may not be as healthy as other individuals? Uh, there could be some confounding in that, but still just the same. One of five more serious illness in reference to a pandemic. Uh, you know, it'd be nice to get a little bit more delve into this deeper in this risk benefit analysis because that's pretty disconcerting overall. And that requires some guidance. Next, just trivia here. Stress in America. How bad is it and how long has lockdown's been occurring and how, especially here where I'm in California, we're all terrified because what happens is they give this lockdown, this vaccine mandates and everything else like that. Then they never tell you what is the required outcome in order to end the lockdown. That should be against the law. You just can't say, all right, state of emergency, everyone do this, but I'm not going to tell you when the state of emergency is over. The state of emergency is over when I say it's over. No, that that's that's not democracy or, or republic or anything else or a free society. But let's go through this right off the bat. Stress in America, stress in, and decision making during the pandemic conducted by the Harris Poll on behalf of the APA found that one in three Americans said sometimes they are so stressed about the coronavirus pandemic that they struggle to make even basic decisions, what to wear and what to eat. Now, I am not here to bemoan any age group whatsoever, but here, but there interested but here we go millennials 48 percent were particularly likely to struggle with this when compared with their counterparts gen z adults 37 percent gen xers 32 percent boomers 14 percent and older adults who just don't give a dang any longer as are parents 47 percent versus non-parents so stressed they can't figure out what to wear or what to eat now i can tell you how many times i've been angry especially here in california leaving the house to go to uh let's say a store and forgetting that face mask or whatever it is, just so you can enter, you know, that really is irritating to have to turn around and pick that up. But I can tell you that's a pain in the butt. But outside of that, uh, the agree the coronavirus pandemic has made them rethink how they were living their life. You know, it's, it's, it, it they, they got, they got to bring this to an end. And my, my fault is not belittling the pandemic, my major grudge is the fact is all the research that we covered over the past year, did I reiterate that again, reiterate, they've taken almost no advantage of any of the breakthroughs whatsoever and said to the exact same draconian measures that have been around since the Justinian plague, hence for us the mask, uh, is, uh, you know, this, at least they did a better job than the Justinian plague in reference to distance, you know, distance, lockdown, mask and obviously they probably didn't have variolation back then variolations where they cut you and just put the or they could even blow it up your nose like they used to do in uh i think that was discovered was it india or china i forgot that they dealt with this uh with some of the viruses uh but otherwise it's been around for quite some time but still uh technology is advanced we have the uv light ozonation you name you name and everything else that we covered over here but no we're still stuck with basic, uh, very, very basic um, Boolean uh, problem solving skills. But otherwise, outside of that, yeah, that's that's how much it's affecting people. Bad. Depend it's more than just the illness. It's the collateral damage from the, the pandemic lockdown itself that's be taken into account. Next, this is interesting. HCSC researchers discover how people's values affect their attitude to COVID-19 restrictions. I just like this now. I see the National Research Research University Higher School of Economics. 
because of what they said, you know, the stay home, save lives, media campaign. Uh, but now not to take it out of context, you know, they're finding out who's more towards the likes the lockdown things, who doesn't like the lockdown. And there are some people that actually do like wearing masks quite a bit. And it seems like they never wanted to end. But however, though, here we go. But this is what they, this is part of the conclusion. Now, I have to be careful not to take it out of context, but I just want to quote it out and I'll have the link so you can read it on your own. Moreover, the research revealed that framing COVID-19 as a high risk significantly increased support for anti-COVID-19 measures, which in researchers' opinion, the researchers' opinion, could promote support for anti-democratic policies across the globe. Daily reports the number of deaths and new infections Every time I opened the paper, they had the big charts, you know, da, 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 over and over again. You know, cumul the, 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 we did this for a long period of time. And know who else did this too? Remember, before the to give us two weeks and flatten the curve, all the leaked videos coming out of China and people have biohazard suits and people falling on the streets. Uh, you know, regardless of where you think the origination of the SARS CoV 2 came out, the, the, the setup on the reference to people in biohazard suits and leaked video and everything else like that, and people just collapsing in, you know, in the, the hospitals being built. It, you know, those things were taken down almost the day they were put up. And then we got, then it got to us. And then it just took off like wildfire because all the propaganda ahead of time. But here we go. The other parts of the number of deaths and new infections result in a considerable overestimation of the mortality risk posed by the novel coronavirus. Such distorted estimates make people more willing to forfeit their rights and freedoms in the name of safety. This creates a threat of widespread support for autocratic policies that political forces in many countries could take advantage of. Moreover, USA, moreover, disproportionately high estimations of the COVID-19 mortality risk undermines citizens' trust in the government's ability to fight the pandemic, explains the researcher. Isn't that a breath of fresh air? So basically, they just, they just said what we're all thinking, you know, People are terrified. There's no doubt about that. People are afraid. People know people have been affected by COVID or SARS-CoV-2 without a doubt. Um, but again, my beef has been the fact is there have been a lot of great re there's been a lot of great research which they've just let go fallow, fallow, yeah. And so for whatever reason, uh, have never incorporated. Like I said, I will repeat over and over again: UV lights, UV two two two, UD two two five four. Uh, ozonation, you know, lots of different things that could have been out there, which had been very great in mitigation uh, and allowed people to live their lives freely. But nope, not interested. All right, here we go. We knew ventilation way before the mask thing, because why? Because masks don't seem to fit the face for most people properly. But to proceed. All right, persistent and neutralizing antibodies for 11 months of SARS-CoV-2 infection in the southern region of New Zealand. This is really good research because of the parameters in reference to the context of what they're looking at. During the first wave of SARS-CoV-2 infection in New Zealand, a cohort, 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 a 78 PCR confirmed COVID-19 cases were recruited in the Southern District Health Board region. Here we report this unique cohort nearly one year after the infection. This has been going on so long. There has been no known community transmission in the region over the study period. Interesting due to New Zealand's elimination status at the time, nor had any participants received a COVID-19 vaccine. In the absence of re-exposure, antibody reactivity to the viral spike protein, as well as neutralizing antibodies to both the ancestral strain and the Delta variant remained relatively stable between eight and 11 months. Relatively stable, reiterate, between eight and 11 months post-infection. This suggests Long-lived antibody responses can be generated from a single natural infection event. However, given the risk and seriousness of diseases, here's the virtue signal, which has nothing to do with the study. But again, everyone wants to keep their job. Isn't that sad? However, given the results of serious infection, sars cov vaccination is still strongly recommended. All right, so there it is, virtue signaling. Every article I read, it's like they always have to like incorporate that, even though it has nothing to do with the research itself. Um, but there it is. Natural infection, 8 to 11 months, relatively stable in an area where there's no reinfection. So that makes it a really unique uh, aspect. So basically, if you're like, uh, you, you, yeah, you get infected with SARS and you go to Antarctica, 
and then you don't come back for an entire 11 months. You could have the same antibody levels as you did when you left, regardless of that, to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 strain. Very interesting. All right, next, we go to six months, six sequelae, sequelae, post-vaccination. Here we go. Read. I'm going to read the excerpts. We covered this when we were first opened up, but here we go. Outcomes are coded uh, representing documented COVID-19 sequelae in six months, meaning they were infected prior. For those that are familiar with the word, which is a fun word to say, sequelae. And six months after a confirmed SARS CoV 2 infection recorded between January 1st and August 31st, 2021. But not other outcomes, including this one. Uh, now, because they found out in their research that it, it helped, uh, the vaccine helped with certain aspects, but did not help with other aspects. And again, we're talking background rates. Remember, background rates is, is, a, is going to hear that a lot, and but it can lead to confounding when it, you're only using the reported adverse event reports as your as your Q equivalency to the background rate of a year when there was no COVID vaccine. You know what I mean? Uh, but not other comes including long COVID feature, renal disease, mood anxiety, and sleep disorders. Again, sleep disorders, we go back to the, uh, is the Hong Kong one, where they also noticed uh, the potential for sleep disorders. So again, uh, this may be, yeah, nope, that's not it. But however, though, we will find it a little bit later on again. Yeah, the autoimmune one, sleeping signal. That's the one. So we're going back to this other study from the Hong Kong one. This is why all of a sudden now sleep disorders really caught my attention when I started seeing it come up in a multiple number of studies. So back again, sleep disorders. And then we go down. Do, 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 We saw the chart. In contrast, no significant difference in the risk of many other outcomes, including composed uh, composite of death and any long-term COVID-19 feature. As we brought to this attention here, we brought to attention there, as you see, vaccinated, unvaccinated, over the ages 60 or older, I should say. Scroll down. On the other hand, previous vaccination does not appear to be protective against several several previously documented outcomes of COVID-19, such as long COVID-19 features, arrhythmia, joint pain, type 2 diabetes, liver disease, sleep disorders, and mood and anxiety disorders, all right? So let's go down. In this group, the effects were large and robust, whereas in the age 60 year older group effects were smaller and not statistically robust, all right? In older patients, the pure, this is interesting. Again, this is a hypothesis, not a discovery of the research, hypothesis. In older patients, the B cell response to vaccination might itself be ineffective. So they have a little footnote there as far as reference to the other study. To proceed, in summary, the present data show that prior vaccination against COVID-19, especially after two doses, is associated with significantly less risk of many, but not all outcomes of COVID-19 in younger, but not older individuals, which is ironic since the vaccine was basically supposed to help the older individuals. These findings may inform service planning, contribute to forecasting public health impacts of vaccination programs and highlight the urgent need to identify, develop additional preventative and curative interventions for sequelae of COVID-19. Interesting. And again, that could be why also too, we're still seeing almost a, just a mass effect in those individuals which are elderly which still succumbing to SARS-CoV-2 or whatever to proceed. Boosting of cross-reactive antibodies with endemic coronavirus by SARS-CoV-2 infection, but not vaccination would stabilize spike. This is just something for the future. Something may arise from this, but for, so I'm going to read it now and link it so you can always come back to it once we get the um, videos bookmarked for you at the exact same time. In contrast, vaccination would stabilize spike. MNRA vaccine did not, reiterate, did not robustly boost cross-reactive antibodies suggesting different antigenicity and immunogenicity, genicidity, and genicidity, if I conclude the sentence. In sum, this study provides evidence that antibodies targeting endemic coronavirus are robustly boosted in response to SARS-CoV-2 infection, but not vaccination with stabilized S, and that depending on confirmation of other, or other factors, the S2 subdomain, remember we covered this six months ago, 
of the spike protein triggers a rapidly recalled immunoglobulin dominant response that lacks neutralization activity. Aha, uh -huh. what does that mean? Well, it means something like this, if you want to look at that. Yeah, and the study was actually done in, in pregnant in pregnant women or pregnant individuals. You know what I mean. All right, but still, this, this is the same. And if we go down, no one knows what this means, but it's such an incredibly divergent aspect on the immune system, it's fascinating. But again, is it harmful? Is it detrimental? But it's different, but no one knows. But to proceed, likewise, while both vaccination cohorts showed an absence of or reduction in boosting of cross-reactive responses, whether this absence is beneficial or detrimental cannot be determined from the data presented here. In sum, the study provides evidence that antibodies targeting OC43 are robustly boosted in response to SARS-CoV-2 infection, but not vaccination with stabilized S, and that the S2 subdomain of the spike protein is likely responsible for triggering a recalled immunoglobulin dominant response. Remember, there was while non-neutralizing, the role of this cross-reactive antibodies in context of the infection is not yet known. Well, isn't that comforting? All right, and then we covered this article before. I'll link this article too, and hopefully eventually, the, this, this is a pretty strong claim by the Research Institute uh, that was from the Center for Disease Control. Uh, but in all fairness, once they uh, have a solid link, they review the data, you notice I don't see a DOI citation, uh, then we could look at it. But right now I can't. But regardless of that, it it's, it's, it, you know, selection bias, yeah, uh, per se on my part, but I want to include it just the same. It's positive in reference to basically inoculation, but it's a positivity or an outcome that is not reflective of the, a lot of the studies that you and I have been reviewing. And we are going to review the data right now. Let us begin. We'll do this fast. Da, da, da. All right. Again, whoop, before I begin, just to play it safe. Disclaimer. Do, do, do. Disclaimer. And nope, that's email. Back to the disclaimer. Here it goes. Da, da, da. <laughs> Who knows what email I got? All right. We're looking about to look at VARES. And this goes for the Endura Vigilance at the exact same time. We're going to look at both vaccine data sets. Reports alone cannot be used to determine if vaccine causes are contributed to an adverse event or illness. The reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, or coincidental, or unverifiable, especially since they have so many of them. But to proceed, here we go. Total reports reported to have to be confirmed or whatever by the CDC once they have the people to do it is now at 639,876 adverse events reported to the CDC and reports by age and mortality. Now, again, they're going to say, well, the background rates of mortality are about the same. And you're going to, the background rates have to be used in the proper contextual environment, you know, compared to what? You just can't count the reports, you know, two bears as being considered all of mortality for that period of time. But reported two is 8,052. If you read these reports, most of them are pretty immediate. And so you can see the, the reason for the assumed correlation. And there's that. Let's go down real fast. If anything pops up, I'll let you know. And da, 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 da. We're, I'm just going to go down here. I'm going to go past all these. Uh, I don't think that anything is different as far as the uh, symptoms of all ages. Fatigue. Let's f focus on the fatigue real fast, too. Uh, this was uh, those who mortality, uh, the relationship. You see, you notice a lot of COVID-19 is being associated potentially to breakthrough um, infections. And of course, children are highly concerned about as well. We look at their chart, uh, and that's the most common reported uh, ailments or uh, reactions from children reported two bears. But we got the synopsis down here pretty well, so let's just go straight to that. Da 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 da. da. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. What? What's this? All right, here we are. Check this out. Now this is what we're doing. I looking for sleep disorders. We're looking for basically strings, narcolepsy, and, and hypersomnia, all right? So you can start to see certain reactions here as you read through the reports of individuals. These are not 
uh, you know, not basically just people just making up stuff. You have to read what they're actually saying. Now, I'm only doing the first uh, 200 characters of each report. So you get, uh, you know, if you read some things, obviously hallucinations is quite interesting. Uh, you know, and they're pretty detailed in what they're what they're stating. They're not just basically your random reports, uh, and they're pretty uh, disturbing. Uh, you know, suspected as I mean, they they're well, and a lot of them, are, you know, kind of some of them are a little sloppy. A lot of them are well written now. Uh, this one, like for example, here. He already tests jaundice, and then you realize, you know, contractable patient's mother reporting information for herself and her baby. This this is the baby report for jaundice. Uh, you know, it's like really disturbing. You don't know the correlation or whatever it comes down to be. And then I did obviously fatigue, exhaustion, and tired. Now this is just the first few reports of uh, this. Now what's happened is between here, the number of reports for fatigue. Uh, the 95,380 reports of fatigue and 149 reports of narcolepsy or hypersomnia, somewhere between there may be a potential signal. See hypersomnia, which I didn't say narcolepsy as yet, but right there. And this is fatigue right here. So there's your reports. Thrombocytopenia, uh, two VARES. Remember, these are reports, two VARES, not coming from the CDC. These are reports to the CDC. Thrombocytopenia, cervix, paralysis, myocarditis, 6,000, Bell's palsy, 6,452, uh, mortality, 8,052, reported two, thrombosis, uh, shingles. Now remember the myocarditis is weird because now next week I'll have the average age breaking down for you too because the average age is about 20 where the rest of these are about 50 or so. And then fatigue right here. So somewhere between here and here may be a safety signal. We'll see as time moves forward. All right, next, uh, compare our states. All right, now here's the thing. So here we have Florida, for example. We look at this, we're we following the states. And let's just reset that here. There's that. And, but let's go to the top real fast. Because the top is going to give it the age, the mortality, in reference to basically the, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And this is where the vaccines are failing if they're not working for the of the above the age of 60. That can explain a lot of this too, continuing to rise. One to four year olds. This is CDC information that we're reviewing. And so 65, 177, 15 to 24. I don't like that gap because it's quite disturbing. If you look at 50, you know, if we could separate that, oops, separate that there somehow. But that because 15 to 24 is probably an inappropriate grouping. Uh, per se, and so then 35 to 44, you get you get the picture, and I want to see if I can reset. Um, see if it, yeah, there it is. It went away, but you know, this is probably not the best way to group the ages together. You see what I mean? All right, now we'll go down a little further. Let's see if there's anything else we missed on the, uh, the states. Yeah, that's the hospitalizations. You know, there's plenty of beds. You see this basically deaths per 100,000. All the states follow the exact same pattern, it seems like. Some go up, some go down, some go a little later. Montana, they have different y-axis, so don't be deceived. But you see the patterns are pretty, pretty uh, algorithmic. All right, deaths per 100,000 across the entire United States. Um, you know... I don't know if we've done any better in our treatments from May 2020 to today, because I'm looking at the data and the data looks pretty sucky, uh, per se. If I was to try to make a guesstimate, looks look how symmetrical that is. Isn't that weird? Between January, between May, and it's, it's pretty symmetrical. And then we look at the states, and we did the Florida thing as we did before. And again, to reiterate, just in case you missed it, do 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 do. Do we go down to October 28th? Florida is at 0.17, new deaths per 100,000, smoothed. California, 0.23, lockdown, maniacal pandemic. As you can tell, I'm not a fan of what's going on, especially since Florida is surpassing California. And California is just, no, it's not fun. Uh, 
Florida sounds more fun. New York, a little maniacal in itself and mandating vaccines. But yet, with all this vaccination and mandating, you know, why is Florida doing better by not mandating than the other places that are mandating? In Texas, of course, we understand the challenges they're having and so on and so forth. But now an interesting thing about Texas is we want to see if they're going to follow the same pattern because you see this drop down. Interesting. And then I don't think of any additional data of, of uh, value there. So let's begin the next one, mutations. Here we go. Da, da, da. Eventually, mutations. There we are. Look at the correlation. This is global people fully vaccinated per 100. And the course, uh, total cases per million, 0.91 correlation. Remember, correlation is not causative. But man, this has been correlating since the very since February 20, uh, 2021. Right, let's keep it going. Oh, which have passed an hour. So let's go. Da, 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 da. Let's get that here. Pass this information there. Da, da, do, 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 do. Pass the information. Passing, 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 passing. Going to go to a synopsis. The, main, the objective is this. The biggest, the biggest beef, and I'll use that word again, I have with a lot of the data being presented, especially seeing whether certain pandemic mitigation aspects work, whether it be non-pharmaceutical interventions or whether it be vaccinations, inoculations or whatever. And um, you have to have controls. And the only controls that you and I are using in a very basic way is looking at other countries which have not incorporated those, uh, in, uh, those pandemic mitigation measures and seeing how they compare. So here we go. Let's look at the vaccines. And here we are. Do, do, do. Let's make this up. That's, we, I think we're okay. Can we make this a little smaller? Did you get it all in there? There. Ah, where'd it go? There we are. There. And now it's paused. And there it is. Now we're not paused. Now it's bouncing all around. There it is. All right, total cases per million. Zero to 10 vaccine people vaccinated per 100. This is what this represents. Fully vaccinated people per 100 as of October 30th. You tell me if you see a correlation. I, I've been doing this for a long period of time. I'm not pro or against. I'm just being very bullion. I want to see at least a correlation. I mean, if I at least have a correlation, I don't have to even be. I don't have to even, don't have to even prove causation to me. Show me a freaking correlation. And so zero to 10, 11, 20, new deaths per million. And, you know, it's obviously a lower on this end, but it's not as low as the people at zero to 10. And I picked, again, this is representing countries with the human development index of 0.6 or higher and populations of 5 million or more. Reproduction rate. Eh, you, may, you may have a little bit there, but not at the 31 to 39. It's still lower than the people at 71 to 100 uh, fully vaccinated per 100. And show me a correlation. I don't care how you know well-educated the individual is or what college they graduated from. Just show me a correlation. New cases smooth per million. Zero to 10. Up to 40, 49, and then again up to 71 to 100. I mean, show me a, show me at least a negative correlation to where if their vaccines are resulting globally, not just in one territory. I hate that from the beginning of the whole pandemic. It's nothing to do about comparing states and countries different mitigation aspects. It's all about just, just work with what your own country and see what difference it makes. That was really the most, the biggest scientific misstep I ever saw leading to basically, you know, overinflation of uh, other aspects. But look at that. Just show me a correlation. All right. And here's the countries, uh, Portugal, if you want their data set, that's amazing. Portugal's almost 87.1 fully vaccinated per hundred. Uh, you know, and you got the United Arab Emirates, Spain, Singapore, so on and so forth, down the line, to Ghana, Kenya, Nicaragua, Libya, so on and so forth. There's your countries which are on the lower end, Venezuela, Palestine, Indonesia, you can see all down the line, Russia. You'd think Russia would be maniacal about it. No, they're only at 32.37. Interesting. And so let's go down. Dun, dun, dun. Let's make this a little bigger again. And this, I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build these plots a little easier, uh, so I don't have to really bounce all around. Here we are. Let's uh, let's see. We're here. Yeah, hopefully this is in 4K. Let's make this a little bigger once again. Take a gamble there. Bring it to 100%. And oops, not there yet. 
And so here we are. So there you are, Portugal and everything else like that, all the way down to Ghana. Now, they're all going to maintain the exact same spot. So fully vaccinated per 100, total deaths per million. Oops, got to click this twice. Show me your correlation. Reproduction rate. Wow. Can you tell anybody's been vaccinated? And then cases per million. Oops, give me a forget that. Apologize. Actually, look, look at the skew. You see what I mean? That could be caused also to the test, which I have one included as well, too. Because you see they do more testing. So that could be part of the reason for the skewing. Case is smooth per million. Check it out. You got some spikes here, spikes there. Just show me a correlation. And then I think that's going to a variant trend. Real fast. Obviously, Delta is the thing. New deaths per million in the United States, down to about four. Positivity rate, about 0.7. Uh, fully vaccinated, yeah, we know. There it is. India, not very much vaccinated. Little spike, but they was, guess what? They started getting vaccinated more. So we're about four. They're about 0.4. Positivity rate, they're not very positive at all. Uh, India, vaccination rate, they really jumped up there compared to the way they were before. Uh, but then we go to Sweden. No lockdown Sweden, but they are fairly vaccinated. Uh, 0.4 deaths per million compared to the United States at a 4 plus. Positivity rate, well, they're more positive than India. They're just less vaccinated. And then there, and then down the line, as you can see the comparison there. All right, we looked at the data file, so we'll pass over this web scraping. And let's go to Endure Vigilance, and then we'll call it a night, right? There we go. Endure Vigilance, how is Europe doing? Europe is doing as follows. They have 479,518 serious event reports reported to Adderant Vigilance. Vigilance. There's a breakdown on each uh, vaccine uh, as far as the serious events. Serious events to them require hospitalization. So I believe 479,518 hospitalizations which were associated uh, or reported to Adderant Vigilance. Now, total Total reports to Yadura Vigilance is up to now 1,115,395. All right, there's your breakdown of what's reported. Yeah, I should break this down as percentage to be fair because you could have a higher number of reports to a vaccine, but if it's, you know, just, but if it's more of the vaccines being administered, it creates a skew. All right, and then we look down here. Do, 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 do. Most common things being mentioned in the serious events. And they're going down here. Let's go straight down here. Serious adverse event reports. All right, here we are. This all the, I should take um, seriously. Now, again, that's, they have a different reporting system. But now we have to look at background rates. All right, you understand what I'm talking about. All right, now these are the serious reports they have here. Jane had a little mis little misnomer there. So we look at mortality. Uh, there's your most common reports that they're having right now down the line. And so you can see they have a little different reporting system. Also at the same time too, they don't report as well as age. Now these are serious reports, which is really weird because mortality is less in the serious reports than the overall. The overall, what we're basing it on Let's see if I can find the information real fast. Here it is. Fatal designation. So a fatal number of reports with fatal designation is 17,241. So, you know, which is interesting because they're not reported as in the serious grouping, which we'll fix that. But this is the most common things uh, noted on the fatal designation reports to endure uh, vigilance. And so... That's what it is. And this is the first time I actually saw uh, this on there. So in the top in the top categories, facial paralysis, which could be considered Bell's palsy, you know, things like that. Uh, so we'll look at it, the whole, uh, we've seen this more and more as well too. Interesting. I may want to uh, light this up with the US one. And see if anything's popping up as well here on the uh, on the regular our U.S. VARES reports as 
far as your vigilance. Ah, all right. Now let us begin. Let's close this out real fast. What did we cover tonight? Do, do, do. All right, we recovered. Going backwards, we looked at the CDC uh, report where they said that's that much much better. But again, we'll see once we get the data out there, so we can break it down. We covered boosting. Do, 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 do. Uh, basically, they the vaccine and the natural infection seem to have a strong divergence. Uh, what that means yet, we don't know, but it just was brought up again just recently. Uh, this October 28th, uh, we looked at basically uh, something going on where uh, normal outcomes is not, you know, again, it's counter in reference to the CDC uh, information that was just released, but still just the same. Let's look at everything. Doesn't appear you that effective in the 60s or older, at least in reference to long COVID and mortality. And again, the links to this research will be there as well, uh, too. And then we go backwards. Uh, the persistence of neutralizing antibodies 11 months in New Zealand get not exposed to anything anywhere, just exposed once and stable after 8 to 11 months, which I think is fairly good news. All right. The HSC say, hey, you just, just keep on distorting the figures, and that's the great way to have anti democratic policies across the globe. I don't know if that's me just adding my publisher bias to it, but that's how they concluded it. And I'm just picking the three paragraphs potentially out of context. All right, still next after that, stress so bad that people can't figure out what to wear or what to eat, especially along certain age groups. Statins, consult your medical professional. Uh, one in five chance more serious illness, maybe, but not likely uh, helpful in reducing mortality or severity. In fact, potentially the opposite. After that, association, do do do. Uh, whether you think it's worth the risk or not, I think that should be a personal opinion, especially people with high risk allergy. I think it's kind of maniacal to force people to go through such an incredible um, uh, experience just for the sake of conformity. Uh, da -da. Especially you know, if the vac now here's my take: if the vaccine had long term, I mean, really long, strong immune like a boosting, like with like pertussis or something like that or tetanus, then I could say, hey, you know, all right, that may be worth it. But, you know, this is going to, if a person's going to have to endure this every six months because the vaccine, the immunity keeps on waning, at least with the flu vaccine, they change it every year uh, to match the strains. The COVID vaccine, now we're just keeping you the same strain over and over again, even though the strain that we originally made the vaccine for doesn't exist anymore. Delta, you know, it's like, come on, at least try. All right, after that, uh, autoimmune uh, conditions again, sleep disorders. Uh, just to keep an eye out. All right, just just it's popping up on multiple reports now. Uh, at the same time, uh, vaccine mandates. Uh, yeah, that really worked real well for Canada. Hope it was worth it. 0.9 percent more people vaccinated uh, after the mandate. Up to eight weeks after. Great. All right, the path from pollutants, something real important in reference to general health, uh, especially in areas which don't necessarily have the cleanest uh, environment or, you know, industrial areas or places without clean water, cadmium. Uh, degrading vitamin D and its correlation in being beneficial, uh, fairly important. That can play some strong confounding uh, in reference to research and reference to vitamin D if there's high levels of cadmium in individual's blood, especially if there's a half-life of 15 years. All right. Potential new treatment for COVID-19 uh, identified benfoxthymin. I just think that was really cool. When infected cells, uh, replication was suppressed, infected cells did not produce coronaviruses. Again, lots of incredible, incredible signals and to reference to potential great treatments. Fund them, please. Heparin, again, wonderful research out of Brazil. They got the, the timing, the window down, the type, and also the reduction in mortality of up to 78%. Uh, that's that's really cool. That should be news news. And then of course, the cool one as well is Syzygium, Syzygium aromaticum. Again, what is Syzygium aromaticum? Which is really cool. That it had, tends to have completely blocked SARS-CoV-2 replication, may uh, completely blocked SARS-CoV-2 replication. Uh, what is it? 
again, if you want to be a really smart at a party, Sigium Aromaticum to conclude doo -doo -doo, is Clove. Again, hope you found this all interesting tonight. Gratitude. Thank you for watching. I look forward to all seeing you again. Well, it's actually also happy Halloween next week. Catch you all next time. Ralph signing off. See you then. Bye.